<clears throat> okay, uh, so um, um, we had some technical problems here, but uh, I will begin the presentation now. Uh, we'll talk about two architects today. Uh, the first one is uh, Philips uh, Wing Bones, Big Bones. Uh, I, I'm not sure I pronounce very well his name. He's uh, Dutch. Um, so let's uh, let's read a little bit about him. So uh, Philips, uh, Philips uh, Winkbuns, uh, uh, he was uh, born uh, well, in 1607 on Wikipedia, the day is not shown, but on my list uh, with, uh, with the celebrations, with homages, he appears that he was, uh, he was born uh, on this day. So was a Dutch architect, he was part of the school of Jacob van Kempen, that is uh, Dutch classicists. So we are going to see the works of, a, of, a, of an architect uh, from the 17th century uh, who was uh, very active in Amsterdam. So Wink Bones was especially highly regarded in his native city of Amsterdam. In contrast with Jacob van Kampen, uh, Wink Bones, uh, who was a famous architect uh, at that time, uh, Wing, uh, Wing Bones uh, knew how to fit classicism creatively with the typically narrow city houses of Amsterdam. Philips is well known as the, uh, is well named as the inventor of the Amsterdam um, Hartskebel, literally neck front type of facade, a uh, very, a uh, very narrow uh, facade, a very narrow building since in 1638, he designed the oldest surviving this building, Horst Gevel, uh, in Amsterdam at the uh, Herrengracht 168. Indeed, it is even sometimes called the Wing Bones Gevel after him. So it's a, it's a type of building which is typical for Amsterdam, and we are going to see several examples. It was widely imitated in the period of Dutch classicism from 1640 to 1665 on a grand scale. On simpler houses, it appeared as a simple brick pilaster Hatzgevel with a few restrained ornaments. This type is a Wingbones uh, imitatia. Anyway, uh, another of his designs was a uh, Klovensburger, uh, I have problems with the Dutch language, I confess, in the, which he built in 1642, one of the most finely proportioned classical school city palaces in Amsterdam. Philips lived during the high point of Amsterdam's power and wealth halfway through the 17th century and became the city's most important architect and designer. Not a little thing to be in the 17th century, the most important architect in a city like Amsterdam. He especially designed houses since as a Catholic, he was passed over for state commissions. In 1648 and 1674, a book was published with Philip's uh, designs through which we have a good idea of his work. So let's look at some of his drawings. Uh, very few, you see very narrow buildings which exist in Amsterdam to this day and they give a particular feeling and a particular look about, uh, about the city. Uh, he built quite a number of these and we are going to see them. This is not going to be a long presentation, it's an introduction to the work uh, of an architect that um, I myself found out about uh, rather late. Uh, a longitudinal section through, through one of these buildings Now what you see here at the top is actually just a facade. Nothing happens behind. It's just a wall, an ornamental wall or ornamented uh, wall that uh, gives uh, a coiffure, if you want, you know, exaggerated. Uh, essentially the building ends here. So what we see here is just the decor, nothing else. Uh, here is the plan of one of these typical uh, houses in uh, in uh, Rotter in uh, Amsterdam, uh, very long and uh, rather narrow.
you even wonder how these uh, rooms are, are lit no because uh, you see there are windows just uh, at the edges but what happens here in the middle sorry i don't know what's going on uh, Here it is another one, and uh, as I said, he built uh, many of these. Well, not very impressive, but uh, <laughs> I mean, not very impressive in terms of uh, graphic uh, representation. Here is another one. It's literally a diagram. Uh, but uh, you'll see the buildings, uh, built buildings are more rich and more convincing. Apparently, he even used, or I don't know, the, the one who analyzed this uh, facade, uh, you know, found all kinds of circles there. If, if that's how the architect worked, we don't know. Now, I, I took this information from uh, the, the Dutch uh, website. So, um, no, it's actually not. It's, uh, the, well, this is the, na the name. You are under this name, you are going to find with different numbers, various houses. Let's look at this one. Uh, so again, we are in Amsterdam with a typical architecture, which apparently was, uh, uh, you know, uh, invented uh, to a large extent by this architect. And as I said, you know, uh, what is at the top is, uh, you know, often, if not always, uh, just uh, decoration, if we are to call it so. Very large windows. Otherwise, the building is, uh, you know, very, very simple. But, but it's a particular type of building uh, specific to Amsterdam. Maybe, I don't know if Rotterdam had something similar, but Rotterdam was heavily bombed during the Second World War. So we don't have many examples of what what we call traditional architecture. This is another building, the Biblical Museum on the canal, uh, that canal in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. You see, you know, what is here at the top, it's, um, you know, a dramatic uh, coiffure, but uh, essentially, uh, you know, my, it's, it's, the, it's the roof behind. And in some cases, uh, you don't even see the roof, although in this, in, in this picture, we do see it. Uh, if this is the, the Amsterdam classicism, that's, that's, that's how it was called. It's, it's, it's different from what, us what we usually call classicism. But in Amsterdam, uh, you know, they, this kind of buildings uh, belong to its, its classicism. It might not be the classicism of other cities, these windows are uh, very, you know, almost peculiar because when you talk about classicism, you don't imagine this kind of, you know, uh, windows, rather large, considering for the century when they were built. Not in all cases he has uh, that, that maybe here the windows had been replaced, that is possible too. This one looks more like a mall, but not, uh, not, not, not so much uh, in, in touch with, uh, with uh, or resembling uh, the classicism of other countries. Uh, here you see a very peculiar picture because at first, I thought that it was something wrong. It's a distorted, and I, I still feel that perhaps it's a distorted picture because you see this large, dramatic uh, ending of this facade at the top, and it has no thickness almost. You know, it's, it, it's a Potemkin facade. It's just a, a facade and behind it, the top, sorry, again, is something something wrong with, 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 my, with my laptop or, or with Zoom. I don't understand. Today is a strange, uh, strange day.
So we are in Amsterdam in the 17th century, and uh, we look at, at, at the works of this architect who apparently, uh, you know, uh, worked on, 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 on this kind of building that uh, is very specific for Amsterdam. Another one with quite uh, quite large windows. This one we saw. Uh, another one. So the, you see, they are very narrow and uh, tall. Although not all of them. This one is uh, more uh, accepting the word classical uh, in relation with uh, with the previous ones. But uh, still. It seems these narrow, tall windows um, are, are uh, most often, uh, uh, you know, a signature feature of, uh, of, of these houses. A well-to-do city, an important city in Europe. And uh, this architect uh, that we talk about today was uh, in his time in the 17th century, the most important architect in, in Amsterdam. It's actually interesting to compare the classicism of Amsterdam in this case with classicism of other cities and other countries. There are differences here. Obviously, this classicism is uh, has a particular uh, charm, mainly because of, uh, of these very large windows. And uh, we also don't see a lot of uh, curtains or uh, oblongs or anything. This is known that, uh, you know, in, in the Netherlands, uh, people don't hide too much. So you, you, there is a lot of transparency. You see through the windows, even at night. It's a very open society, as, as we know. Uh, another one, I guess all these houses are monuments uh, of the city because they are, uh, you know, more than 300 years old but kept in very good shape, as you can see. We talked a few days ago about Pete Kramer, another important architect, but closer to us from the 20th century in Amsterdam, who built about 200 bridges in, uh, on the canals of Amsterdam. We also look at the famous uh, uh, Dutch uh, bicycles. It's a, it's a very charming city because of various reasons. The canals, the bridges, these houses that now we look at and we know now the architect who, who brought them into being. So uh, we know a little bit about Amsterdam now. Of course, in Amsterdam, there was also the famous movement called the School of Amsterdam which was uh, almost the opposite of the steel um, and uh, equally a very, very important architectural movement, the School of Amsterdam. Here it is, a typical building by, uh, by this architect that we are paying homage today. And we see that uh, indeed uh, the representational power of architecture is uh, emphatically present here through the top the coiffure of the building, as I call it. There is a little coiffure here as well, not much on the left, but in the case of this architect, the triumphalism of uh, what the main facade, the street facade uh, means, it's for all to see. He also built, you know, outside of the city. This is the mansion of, uh, of uh, this person, Johan Hude Copper. Um, not very different from what we looked at before. Um, and uh, I didn't find pictures, just a drawing. 
and now uh, we, we go back to within the city. Uh, here it is. A romantic city, Amsterdam, and uh, you know, kept in very good shape. Uh, the, the horrors of the Second World War apparently were unable to, to reach Amsterdam. Uh, another uh, building, this one with uh, different windows, uh, but uh, still the, the urban fabric of Amsterdam is uh, distinctive and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a city that, yes, uh, perhaps it cannot rival with Venice in Italy, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasant city and a very active city. Uh, so, uh, uh, Rotterdam, which is considered the city of the future, is uh, disputing uh, some kind of a hierarchical position within the Netherlands with Amsterdam. So you have Amsterdam, the city of the past, but it's not only the past, even this city in this uh, picture, uh, you know, with the animation of the street shows clearly uh, it's not. But compared to Rotterdam, which was destroyed heavily during the Second World War, Amsterdam has a, a, a you know, a, a rich uh, uh, past presence, so to speak. Another uh, country house built by the same architect. You even wonder how come in the Netherlands there are such big estates because it's a, it's a, it's a, a you know almost they, they almost do not have out of the city space. Uh, here is um, a tower he built a church. I'm not sure if it is a church or a, or a city hall. So he, he, we could call him perhaps some kind of a uh, 17th century El Greco in architecture, narrow, tall buildings. Now, today is also an interesting day because um, today is the day when uh, the great, great, great Russian poet Alexander uh, Pushkin died. And uh, I have a, an affectionate relationship with this poet. I, uh, I, I feel uh, honored in a way to say a few words about him. Pushkin was was the most important poet of Russia and uh, uh, one of the most important poets of the world. And he died in very strange circumstances. And he died on this day, the 10th of February, but a different year. But what is very interesting is that, um, I don't know if you know this greatest poet of Russia, he had some kind of a, um, his great grandfather from his mother's side was was black was from was from africa and uh, he, he was brought to russia he became a general and so on so uh, pushkin was i think uh, special so to speak from this point of view as well but what is very interesting about alexander pushkin is that he wrote um, onegin uh, a literary work of great importance, which I read, in which he described the case of a, of a, of a, of a man, uh, um, I think he was a poet, uh, who provokes to a duel, um, you know, um, I'm not sure, I forgot if in Onegin uh, uh, he was uh, the French ambassador or not, was flirting with his wife or his girlfriend, with his wife, I imagine. So, and in the duel in, in Onegin, the literary works, uh, the poet dies, he is killed. 
by, by the one he provoked to a duel in order to defend his honor. Exactly the same thing happened to Alexander Pushkin two years later. I think two years later, a little bit later, which is a strange case when, within which uh, it's shown that actually it's not life, it's not art that imitates life, but it's life that imitates art. How do you explain it that what, what uh, Pushkin wrote in Onegin happened to him identically a little bit later? after he wrote the literary work. So he died on, on February, February 10th, but in the old uh, system of counting time, it was a different date, but in, uh, in terms of our calendar, it is today, today uh, um, in the year when he died. Uh, what is uh, also interesting is that I read also a, a short story by him the Queen of Spades, and I, 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 I cannot tire uh, reminding myself how beautiful that short story was, and I, I uh, encourage you, I suggest to you to read it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful short story. The problem with greatness is that you cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, you know, frame it. Uh, uh, convincingly within any kind of so-called style. Pushkin was considered a romantic, the, the, the classic, uh, realist. He was all, above, all of the above and none uh, at the same time. But the Queen of Spades, this short story, I was so moved by it that I made a project many years ago, a house for Herman. Herman being the main character in this uh, beautiful short story by Alexander Pushkin. And in a few words, I will tell you the story. It's about a small, uh, you know, a soldier, a small, uh, a poor officer in the army. I don't even know if he was an, uh, an officer at that time. He was poor. He was, uh, you know, uh, he didn't have, uh, you know, uh, financial riches at all, but he had a dream once and in the dream, uh, an angel came to him and told him if he goes to a, um, you know, to a casino kind of, to, to play cards, to play his luck, he would win a fortune. And he does go and he plays uh, the cards that he was told to play in the dream and he wins. So he, he, he's almost rich. Then the next, the next day or so he, again, he's told by the same uh, angel, let's call it an angel, to go and play on the same card and he plays and he wins again. Now he is uh, twice as rich, if not more. And then the third day again, he has this, I forgot exactly how many times he has this dream and how many times he goes to the, let's call it the casino and, and, uh, and, 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 and plays and wins and he's rich now. But at one point, um, uh, something happens, you know, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, we even have a saying in our country, the word is the same thing here. The last time uh, when he goes to play, uh, he, he is uh, uh, tempted to, uh, to play uh, the same card, but uh, uh, a change occurred that, that fate uh, um, uh, fate uh, laughs at him sardonically and he loses everything because he was playing everything, uh, you know, betting everything he had in order to become uh, infinitely, absolutely rich. He loses everything and he loses his mind. And, but I, I didn't do justice at all to the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful short story by, uh, by Pushkin, uh, the Queen of Spades. But I'll show you a drawing, a handmade drawing I made, a house for Herman. That is, that Herman, that was the main character of the Queen of Spades. Now for me, the, the name Herman is, also has uh, autobiographical uh, overtones because I was born in Hermannstadt in Sibiu. So it's the city of Herman. But here we are talking about a different Herman, the character in the Queen of Spades 
by Alexander Pushkin. So let's look at the drawings. I don't have, I'm surprised I still found them. The, the, you know, they are not great pictures, not great resolution, but since today, many years ago, Pushkin died, I thought of paying homage to him with these uh, imperfect words about him and with this uh, project, which I did many years ago. Here is a, a picture of, the, of, of what I did at that time. We see the Queen of Spades and, 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 the, and, the, and the, you know, the, the short story is, is, is called the Queen of Spades uh, and four, uh, four uh, different manifestations of the house for Hermann. On the right, we have a humble, well, uh, a more modest and recognizable house. On the left, we have some kind of a wild, um, you know, configuration, architectural configuration. You could almost call it, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, deconstructivist. And in between them, there are thick walls. They are separated. Reality is separated from dream. Here is the dream, here is the reality. But moving forward inside the, the state of the house, you have a, some kind of a, an intersection, well, a bifurcation here. One goes to the real house, which is a combination between uh, the existing little house and the a megalomaniacal uh, dream. It's the palace, it's the villa, it's the is the house of accomplishment, of uh, verticality, of, uh, you know, well-rounded, uh, you know, uh, uh, emphatic, uh, you know, architectonic presence, because this is supposed to be a house for Hermann. Unfortunately, fate in its uh, uh, infinite uh, diversity and capriciousness made it in the novel uh, uh, maliciously, made it possible for, for uh, Hermann to, instead of arriving here, the house of manhood, of accomplishment, of riches, uh, 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 to lose his mind. So I try to express uh, physically, uh, through the drawing, the, the, the house of dissolution, the house of, you know, the, the, the labyrinth of losing one's mind. So again, the duality, the little house where Hermann lived, the megalomaniacal dream, the culmination, the, the idealization of the, of, the, of, the, of the process of becoming rich through the big building, the villa, and instead fate sends him to the madhouse, which, is, uh, which I try to illustrate in this way. And uh, here you see the two, uh, I made this in like two drawings or two collages, at the bottom is um, is uh, in plan what you saw. It's it's this uh, this uh, drawing uh, that I made, where you see better what I try to explain uh, with the first uh, panel: the little house, the house for Herman. Herman before getting rich, the six 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 separating walls between the little house and the you know, the dream, the wild dream, which as a dream is not yet very crystallized. Then some kind of a combination between the two, the larger, much larger building and emphatic that he was aspiring towards. So psychologically or architectonically speaking, you know, this is how I try to, 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 to uh, express the, the, you know, the, the novel, the, the, the short story, it's not a novel. But instead, there is this um, uh, bifurcation, as I called it, and he ends up in the, in, the, in the madness of the labyrinth on the left, instead of arriving at the, at the big villa, at the mansion. So I sort of uh, showing you these uh, imperfect pictures of this maybe imperfect, imperfect uh, project uh, that I did as an homage to Alexander Pushkin, to his greatness, and to the greatness of this very short story called The Queen of Spades. Um, I, I suggest to you again to read it because it's truly, truly magnificent. Uh, 